Okay. <laughs> nice. Hi, I'm uh, Louis Lazar. I'm a PhD candidate in the biology department at Concordia University. I'm also a public scholar for 2021 and 22. Today I welcome you to my lab walk. As you can see, we have a very different setting from what you're used to if you've looked at other lab walks at Concordia. Uh, I don't have much walls surrounding me or uh, lab material. Uh, it's because of my research topic, which is animal behavior and human wildlife interactions. More specifically, I study raccoon cognition and how it relates with the presence of humans in uh, national parks here in uh, Quebec. Today we are at Yamaska National Park, which is one of the four parks where I've been conducting my study. The other parks were Ile de Boucherville, Oka and Plaisance National Park. As you can see from the color of the leaves, we're already in the fall. Uh, it's the end of my field season, but uh, all of my material is still up out there. We're going to go look at this, a look at the uh, different tools I'm using, the puzzles I use to test the uh, raccoon's intelligence. We're going to go uh, through all this together. As in uh, any lab work, there are some safety measures we need to take. And one thing we need to consider in southern Quebec is the presence of ticks, which can carry Lyme disease. So we're wearing uh, long sleeves, not just for the cool weather, but also to protect ourselves from uh, ticks uh, bite. So uh, let's go. <laughs> one of my smaller projects within my uh, PhD project is uh, to study the activity of raccoon in relation to the presence of humans or human activity. Right now we are in a preservation area of the national park, which means there are hiking trails, but nothing much more in terms of human activities. One smaller project within my uh, PhD project is to study the impact of dogs on the raccoon activity using trail cameras and um, event reports from uh, the staff from the park. I want to see if uh, the level of raccoon activity is influenced by the presence of dogs because there are some campgrounds that accept dogs, uh, other that don't. So I'm comparing the activity in the two types of camping. Trail cameras are very popular with uh, hunters so that they can see the animals there eventually will hunt during hunting season. But it's also very popular with biologists studying uh, animal activity in the wild. And uh, it's motion activated, it has infrared light, so it records at night. That way, with the, the number of pictures it's taking uh, at any given night, we can have an idea of the raccoon activity. So trail cameras now are very easy to use. So this is one of many different models. So we can set up different thing and it gives us the date, the time, the number of pictures it's taken from all the available space on the memory card. So if we just turn it to on, we have a countdown, the light, we have 10 seconds to shut it down and leave it there. It can last for many weeks. So One of the objectives of my study is to um, look into raccoons' ability to solve a problem, so testing raccoons' cognitive abilities. And um, I want to see if they can solve a challenge that I give to them. So I'm using puzzle boxes. This is one of my puzzle box. It's a two-step uh, solution box. There's a simple lock here that they have to slide. And then, obviously, they need to open the door. It's mesh, it's very solid because raccoons are surprisingly strong, <laughs> but it's mesh so that they can smell the scent of the bait. So I would put the bait at the bottom of the cage here and simply close it down like this and wait for raccoons to come and uh, open the cage itself. Because we're working with raccoons, I have to wear gloves because raccoons can carry disease and parasites. So this is another safety feature we need to take into account when working with wildlife in their natural habitat. Normally, now that I've baited the puzzle box, I would turn to the camera. This is a security camera that people would buy to put at their home. I attach it to a tree. 
once again like the trail camera that I'm using for other part of my project. It's an infrared so it can see in the dark and it's motion activated. This records very good videos and that way I can record raccoons interacting with the box and I will analyze those videos at the computer later on. So this is my second model of puzzle box. This one I call the tube for obvious reasons. Uh, once again, it's a two steps resolution problem. The tube turns on itself and it slides. So in this case, I would put the bait in here in the hollow tube here. Um, and then I would turn it like, like this and slide it here. So the raccoons need to um, turn it and slide it to access the bait. Uh, the outer tube has holes in it so that the smell of the bait diffuse well in the environment. And uh, like I mentioned, raccoons are very strong and if they don't access the bait through their problem solving abilities, they're gonna use brute force. So in both cases, with both puzzles, we need to peg the puzzles in the ground. Here I have four holes, have to peg it in the ground very well so that the animal don't just turn it over and shake it until the bait uh, gets out. For now, this puzzle is more often resolved by raccoons from what I've seen from the data, which is very interesting. And one thing that might explain it is that in this case, a raccoon can, uh, by playing with it for a while, uh, find a solution just by sheer luck, which is not what I want to study, but if it happens, it happens. <laughs> Whereas with the other puzzle, you can't slide a lever and open the door by accident. So that would be an explanation why this puzzle is more often solved by the raccoons. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some of the material I carry around in my backpack to conduct the research. One thing that I see right away is my notepad. <laughs> notepad where I write down the information of all the raccoons that um, I capture uh, at every trap that I set. I have my special authorization to carry research. Uh, for this uh, project specifically, I need three different permits. Uh, an authorization from the park, a permit from the Quebec government to conduct uh, trapping activities of raccoons, and I have the ethic certificates from the university. You can't just like, go out and trap animals. You need proper permission and authorization to do that. So I carry that in my notepad. Uh, what else? I have this sign that I hang nearby the, the puzzles that I set up and the traps uh, that just says that uh, there's a, an ongoing study that people shouldn't touch the material because uh, we're recording and uh, conducting a, a study here. There is a, an overall just in case I catch a skunk. So in that case, I would put on the overall. I have another one here. And I would use a bed sheet as well to protect myself from any spray. And by coming near the trap where a skunk is trapped with a sheet in front of us, it lowers the stress of the animals so they are less likely to spray. I haven't used them this year. I used them in the past and everything went well. I never got home smelling very skunky. In terms of the bait for both the trap and the puzzles, here's the recipe. First, there's a small bottle. It's a scent bait. This is a secret recipe that I don't know myself. It was made by a professional trapper and it doesn't smell bad, but it smells very strong. So whenever I get it on my clothes, the smells lingers for a while. This I use to attract raccoons from longer distance. Then I would add either cat food, wet cat food, mm, delicious, or the sardines. Both are very attractive and uh, tasty for the raccoons. As you know, raccoons are omnivorous, so they feed from a variety of different food, but they do like things that taste um, quite strong, so cat food, sardines are perfect for them. 
And then as the ultimate reward, when they get close to the, the trap or the puzzle, I put in marshmallows. And that's usually the first thing they eat when they open the puzzle, it's the marshmallow. So very sweet tooth for the raccoons. So this is the recipe to attract raccoons. And I've had a lot of success with that. And the last thing that is of interest in the bag is um, the tools I use to mark raccoons. So I mark raccoon with individual tags, like this little tag. It's kind of plastic tag, very small. It reflects infrared light very well. So with my infrared cameras, I actually get very good glimpse of the tags uh, when they are uh, put on the animals. And I simply glue the tags with livestock tag cement, so which is glue that is non-toxic, that is used by um, farmers, people like that, to uh, identify animals for a short term. And what I do is that I use long nose pliers. I put glue on the tag and I tag the animals through the trap bars. So I don't have to handle the animal itself. It's a lot less stress for the animals. And because they have a quite long fur, the glue sticks quite well to it. And I always aim for the back of the animal. And I move the tag either more front or back, right, left, so that they are not always set in the same spot. And because it's on the back, there's less chance for the animals to remove it while grooming. Otherwise, yeah, that's pretty much what I have in my backpack for my common tools that I use every day when I trap and set the puzzle box. This is the trap with which I trap the raccoons. So it's a very, very common model of trap. And it has a, this feature with the handle on top which makes things even more fast and easy to set up. How it works, it's very simple. There's a plate at the bottom, and as soon as the animal step on it, the door closes. So when we set up a trap, it's always good measure to test it at least once to make sure that the mechanism functions. And we would put the bait here in the back so that the animals enter from the front here to get the bait in the back, steps on the plate and it closes. Of course, once the animal is there, it's gonna eat the food that is within the trap, but it's trapped. <laughs> so the very important thing when we have trapping is to check the trap frequently and as soon as possible. So what I do is that I set up the trap late in the day uh, early evening and the animal gets trapped at some point in the night and um, early the next morning I check the trap. If I know that I'm not going to be able to be there early the next morning, I don't set the trap. I don't want an animal to be trapped more than 12 hours and ideally it's going to be even less than that. And that's all part of the permits that I obtained to conduct the research. So once I have the trap set up, there might be an animal in there. So the marking happens through the bars. So some of the bars are wider apart, like here on the side. So the animals, most of them are very quiet. Some of them will re react more strongly. Sometimes I just like come close and uh, wait a few seconds for them to settle down. And then with the pliers and the tags that I showed in the bag of material, I uh, installed the, the tag through the bars here with a very gentle pressure on the back of the animal so the glue very much stick to the fur of the animals. And seconds later, I open the cage. What I usually do is that I open it, stand to the back, so my presence to the back will f convince, <laughs> will force the animal to move away from me and exit through the door. Usually animals just strut very quickly away from the trap when I release them. So this is how I trap and mark the raccoons for my study. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the lab walk. So it was a very nice day. I personally really enjoyed it. 
Uh, it's quite different from other lab walks that uh, you've seen uh, with Fort Space at Concordia. Um, so that's part of the, 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 the benefit of uh, being a student in uh, ecology in the biology department at Concordia. So for my research on uh, raccoons behavior, I showed you the, the, the puzzle boxes, the trap that I use so that I can mark the raccoons and uh, the two different types of uh, camera that I use to record raccoons behavior and raccoon activity.